priority is to find evidence to back his theory. He's intrigued by a number of details. These regularly spaced rectangular holes and these chisel marks all along the Grand Gallery. Finally, he reaches the King's Chamber, made entirely out of granite. Gigantic beams above him, weighing about 60 tons apiece, form a flat ceiling. An aberration for the time, considering the thousands of tons of stone piled above it. The chamber is a real architectural feat. He admires the joints between the stones. They're perfect. Not even a razor blade could slip into the cracks. How did the Egyptians manage to transport stone blocks of this size into the heart of the pyramid? Jean-Pierre's internal ramp doesn't solve this problem. It is the second riddle of the Great Pyramid he needs to tackle. At the top of the Grand Gallery, there's a narrow passage leading above the king's chamber. It gives access to five stories of granite beams called relieving chambers. These are topped with an enormous gabled limestone roof. The blocks alleviate the weight pressing down on the roof of the funeral chamber. Without this ingenious system, the ceiling of the king's chamber and the grand gallery would have collapsed. But the granite beams suffered some cracks during construction. To check the extent of the damage, the Khufu builders opened up this passage that leads straight to the heart of the brilliant architectural system. Among the graffiti scrawled by unscrupulous visitors, Jean-Pierre looks for the cartouche of Pharaoh Khufu, first discovered at the beginning of the 19th century. This proves that it's really Khufu's pyramid. It means Khnum Khufu. We are in the heart of the pyramid. It's absolutely incredible. And there are hundreds of thousands of tons right above our heads. And it's all held up by these beams. And it's been here for 45 centuries. You can just feel how calm it is. The serenity is pretty moving, isn't it? At the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, the treasures of the pharaohs are on display. Millions of pieces chronicle the prestigious history of one of humanity's most brilliant civilizations. But paradoxically, only two elements are directly linked to the Great Pyramid. Today, Jean-Pierre has an appointment with the man who designed and built the greatest pyramid of all times. Ironically, the only image of Khufu that has survived is just a few centimeters tall, a minuscule ivory figurine discovered by chance in a temple in 1903. Despite the absence of monumental statues or bas-reliefs, Khufu's memory is still very much alive. An enigmatic sphinx, he continues to intrigue the entire world with the mystery of how his pyramid was built. Jean-Pierre also wants to see what he considers one of the greatest treasures at the Cairo Museum, a 4,500-year-old cedar wood sled. 
Most visitors hardly pay any attention to what seems like some plain, everyday object. Yet, it's a unique piece that offers insight into the pyramid's construction. Wood was like gold for the Egyptians. It cost a fortune to bring wood from Lebanon. So they use it up to the end. Back in Khufu's days, the Egyptians didn't know about the wheel. They used the cedar sleds to haul stone blocks. Considering the tools available to them, the Egyptians accomplished amazing technical feats. Their monumental constructions have weathered thousands of years. They bear witness to the genius of these men from antiquity and continue to fascinate Egyptologists and architects today. Bob Breyer is convinced of the importance of Jean-Pierre's theory. He joins him in Cairo to help him find new clues and evidence. No, just a mint tea. Wahid Maya, Mukin Wahid Shai, Binana, Shikran. To prepare for their expedition the next day, they begin by taking stock of some of the building's theories other people have come up with. Most involve some kind of ramp, but have major flaws, according to the architect. Isaiah is too steep? Yeah, that's a big problem with these ramps. It's a huge problem. Isaiah is too steep? Or it's too long, and then it causes the quarry. Because it's too high. It has to be 1.6 kilometers, and then the ramp would be bigger than the pyramid itself. This one is really steep, good for ski jumps or for the Olympics. It's fine for that. Hey, tell me, what's this? HIV virus? Maybe? This one is interesting. Yes, uh, because uh, the 1.6 kilometers are not in front of the pyramid, but all around it. This type of external spiral ramp around the pyramid raises a number of questions. How could such a ramp be attached to a smooth-sided pyramid? How do you turn a corner with 600 men, considering that's how many people you needed to pull a 60-ton granite block? Besides, with this type of external ramp, you couldn't check the geometry during construction. If the edges weren't perfectly aligned and controlled, the pyramid could end up twisted. For these reasons, Jean-Pierre's theory suggests there were two ramps. First, an external ramp that only went 43 meters high. This would have allowed the first two-thirds of the pyramid's total volume to be put in place, as well as the granite blocks for the king's chamber. In addition to this, the Egyptians would have built a second ramp inside the pyramid. This system offers a solution to the two key problems the Khufu pyramid presented. Its height, 146 meters, and its unique granite chamber. Once they reached the critical level of 43 meters and the granite blocks had been brought up for the king's chamber, the Egyptians would have dismantled the first ramp and recycled the blocks it was made of, hauling them up the internal ramp to finish the pyramid. Nothing would have been wasted. Now the theory needs to be proven. They need to find evidence of his internal ramp. Bob has an idea. Fifteen kilometers south of Cairo, the Egyptologist takes Jean-Pierre to the ruins of a temple that was dedicated to the sun, built 100 years after Khufu. The temple was destroyed at the end of the 19th century, but an architect's drawing of it still exists. On the drawing, we can see that the temple had a corridor similar to Jean-Pierre's internal ramp. Our two investigators want to see for themselves what's left of it. But, uh, I think we, we, we should be able to... To imagine the ramp. Well, you don't have to imagine it, Jean Pierre. Yes. Oh. <laughs> what is I it an internal ramp? Yes. Oh, okay. It is an internal ramp. Oui? Oh, see. 
Certainement Bien yeah, sûr. Sure. That is for sure. Oui. The first you turn, yes. Yes, we go here. It's a quarter turn ramp, like, like mine. Yes. But let me show you something up here. Come on. You're going to like it. Now, this block for the ceiling, right? Yes. The plafond? Yeah, of course. Oui. oui. Color the blue for the ciel, for the sky, right? And there are stars here. You see them? Right yes, there. There's yes, a little yes. circle. And it radiates out? Oh, you have a lot of stars. Yes, yes, all over the block. So this was the ceiling block for the internal ramp. Look at the diagram, though. Let's, yes. let's just see what we can figure out. So we came up the ramp here. Yes. And we made the turn here. Yes. Right? And this block, what do you think? Nice report. Maybe this one, or uh -huh. maybe this one. So this block could be yes. either here or here, this ceiling block. Yes. So okay. it's definitely yes. internal ramp, right? Yes, it is. Yes. Definitely. These remains of an internal ramp prove that the ancient Egyptians knew how to build this type of corridor at the time of Khufu, an important step towards confirming the architect's hypothesis. But the demonstration isn't over yet. Another important aspect of Jean-Pierre's theory can also be tested out in the field. He believes that to form a perfect pyramid, the Egyptians must have laid the outer surface blocks first rather than last, like many previous theories claim. This would have allowed the overall form and angles of the pyramid to be monitored throughout construction. To understand this principle, they need to make a trip to Dashur, about 30 kilometers south of Cairo. Jean-Pierre and Bob are particularly interested in these magnificent casing stones. The outer layer is made of white limestone blocks that weigh between four and five tons and are up to two meters thick, twice as big as the stones positioned behind them. Architecturally speaking, this is a fact of major importance. Amen. They broke the casing stone over, already placed, and put it in place on this block. And after they kept on, it's like that all the way to the top. So these had to be put in smooth right from the beginning, bottom up. It's a concrete evidence that the casing is done as the pyramid rise, and the outside of the pyramid is finished first. The casing stones would have had to be laid first allowing the geometry of the pyramid to be monitored as the building advanced. Next, the Egyptians would have positioned the second row of well-hewn stones, followed by rougher blocks of various sizes that acted as a kind of filler. This would have allowed them to work faster and finish building in about 20 years, like it is mentioned in ancient Egyptian manuscripts. The clues Jean-Pierre has gathered out in the field are encouraging for the investigation, but he wants to find proof that the internal ramp actually existed. You can see two white-ish lines about two thirds up. Oddly enough, these phantom lines reflect the exact position of the internal ramp with the same 7% slope. Is the pyramid breathing? Is it an optical illusion or a thermal phenomenon? <laughs> 